I'm going to draw pictures and make pictures appear on an empty space. He doesn't have a canvas, doesn't have any paper, doesn't have a mural, a wall, but he just takes his palette of paints and sees a nice scene, nice landscape, and starts painting away on empty space. <laughs> so what do you think, O oh monks? Could that man draw pictures and make pictures appear, appear on empty space? And the monks say, no, Bhante. Why is that? Because empty space is formless and non-manifestive. That is, it doesn't manifest anything. It isn't easy to draw pictures or make pictures appear on empty space. Actually, it's impossible to make pictures appear on empty space unless one has maybe some kind of siddhis, iddhis, supernormal powers. So eventually the man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So the man trying to pick, paint pictures in empty space, this would be like the man or person who comes along and tries to provoke you to anger with false accusations, with harsh speech, with angry words with the intention of harming you. And so your mind should be like empty space. Even though the harsh words are directed at your mind, but your mind doesn't display any outbursts, inner outbursts of anger or hatred, and no outward outbursts of angry and harsh words. So you should abide, the Buddha says, with a mind similar to empty space, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without ill will. That is how you should train. Okay, now comes the third simile. And this is, a man comes along with a blazing grass torch and says, I shall heat up and burn away the river Ganges with this blazing grass torch. What do you think? Can that man heat up and burn away the river Ganges with the blazing grass torch? And the monks say, no, Bhante, why is that? Because the river Ganges is deep and immense. It isn't easy. In fact, it's impossible to heat it up or burn it away with a blazing grass torch. Eventually the man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So it was with the river Ganges in the Buddha's day. <laughs> Nowadays with the river Ganges around Calcutta, the mouth of the river Ganges, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> if one comes along with a blazing torch and puts that torch to the <laughs> river Ganges by Cal Calcutta, it, certainly it won't make the river Ganges disappear, but it could well make the river Ganges blaze up into a massive ball of flame. And not only the river Ganges, I saw on a news report a couple of weeks ago, you know this practice called fracking? It's a practice by which natural gas companies try to extract natural gas from the earth by pumping the earth with certain types of organic gases at very, very high density. So it will cause the earth, places in the earth where the natural gas is stored to break apart and then the natural gas will become accessible and then they could drain out the natural gas and direct it through pipes into, um, what do they call this, tanks where they store it. And so what happens is, a, what they do is they go into even communities where they know that the natural gas is, can be found on the ground, and they practice this fracking. 
And as a result, this fracking, this, the high density organic gases that they pump into the ground can seep through the ground to the supply, to the water supply, to reservoirs, to lakes, to streams, and enter into the water supply so that it comes through the drinking water that supplies that community. And so in the news report that I saw, the man was illustrating to the reporter how their water supply had been infected by these high density natural organic gases, organic substances. He turned on the tap and the water came running out of the tap and then after it came running for about one minute, he took the cigarette lighter, lit the cigarette lighter and put it to the tap water and then the tap water burst into flame. And this is going on in many places in this country. Okay, but anyway, during the Buddhist day, water was still water. <laughs> and so with the blazing grass torch, it wouldn't have been easy to burn it up and make it, to make it blaze and burn away. And so then the Buddha gives the, applies the simile and says, in the same way, when others speak to you with harsh, angry words, false accusations, intending to harm you, you should dwell pervading that mind, that person with a mind of loving kindness, then spread the loving kindness throughout the world. And so you should abide pervading the whole world with a mind similar to the river Ganges, abundant, exalted, immeasurable without hostility, without ill will. Then comes the fourth simile. This one is a little peculiar. I don't quite really understand what's going on. Okay, suppose there were a cat skin bag. It's hard to conceive of people killing cats to get the skin to use for a bag. Maybe this is just the name that they use for this type of bag. It's rubbed, well rubbed, thoroughly well rubbed, soft, silky, rid of rustling, rid of crackling. And then a man comes along with a stick or a potsherd, thinking, I'm going to make this catskin bag rustle and crackle. Maybe that would be the sign of a badly matured catskin bag if it rustles and crackles. Maybe it was considered like prestige item, like having a Gucci or yeah. Gucci bag. What are some of the other companies? Coach. 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 Company makes five yeah. leather things. Yeah, they're very expensive. Yeah. Coach. Coach. Yes. Okay. Coach. Pyramid. Pyramid. Yeah. The Gap is that considered? Yeah, no, that's cheap just bags. those are jeans. <laughs> those are cheap bags. Yeah. <laughs> cheap stuff. <laughs> President of Gap listens to you. along tries to make the catskin bag crackle, he can't make it crackle because the catskin bag has been well rubbed, thoroughly rubbed, it's soft, silky and so on. And so the man will only reap weariness and disappointment. And so then the Buddha brings out the point in the same way if others address you in timely or untimely ways, true or falsely, um, gently or harshly, connected with good or with harm, spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate, again you should train yourselves, our minds will remain unaffected, and so on, without inner hate, and then you should develop this all-pervasive mind of loving kindness, similar to a catskin bag. <laughs> Abundant, 
ascend, exalted, unmeasurable, without hostility, without ill will. And then comes the example that gives the title to the discourse, and this is the sort of high point of patience, tolerance, imperturbability, and the development of loving kindness. Even if bandits were to sever you savagely, limb by limb, with a two-handled saw, that's the saw, the saw has a handle on either end, so they take you, tie you up from between two trees, and then they take the saw and they start sawing away your limbs one by one. One who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out or fulfilling my teaching. But even in that situation, you should train yourselves thus. Our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading them with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with them we shall dwell pervading the whole world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train, O monks. Does anybody think they could fulfill that? <laughs> Somebody starts sawing you one limb after another. Can you keep without any anger, without any ill will? What I think is important is he's saying this is how you should train, not you should be able to do that right now. <laughs> Wonderful point. Wonderful point. Train. That's a way, that's a kind of ideal that one should aspire to. It doesn't mean that we've all, that we're all at that state already. I know I'm not at that state. <laughs> yeah, my one testing along this line, I've never been sawed apart, never beaten. <laughs> But again, this goes back to the time when I was living in the forest hermitage in Sri Lanka. I was staying with the older German monk, then called Nanaponika. This could have been 92, 93. And he, because he was at that time in his 90s, it was already 91, 92, and his hearing was weak. And so somebody from America had brought for him a device that looks something like this with earphones that one plugs in and yeah, earphones and then one gives this device, this part, to the person who's speaking to him and they will speak into this and he could hear easily rather than he found it inconvenient to use the hearing aid because it always has to be subtly adjusted but with this kind of device the other person is responsible for the controls. He, the old monk, Yamponika, he just has to put the headphones on. And so we used to leave it on the table in the front room when he wasn't using it. And so one day when he was resting in his room, some young boys came into the forest and they came, they knocked on the door and they said, I opened, I opened the door and they said, We've been walking through the forest, we're thirsty, can we have some water to drink? So I said, okay, wait a moment, I'll get some water for you. So I went back into the kitchen to get a cup of water for the boys. And I came walking into the, back into the front room, the boys were gone. Then immediately my eyes went to the table and the hearing aid was gone, that hearing device. And I realized that once they thought it was a radio, a kind of transistor radio, and they took it to, run, to, to keep it or to sell it. 
and immediately I became very angry. <laughs> But not because it was my device. Maybe if it was my device, I would have taken it with equanimity. <laughs> but because it was my teacher's device, did I say advice? Not because it was my device, but it was my teacher's device. Then I became really angry, and 1992, I was 48 years old. And here was a 48-year-old man chasing after a bunch of 14-year-old boys through the forest. <laughs> they eluded me. <laughs> but eventually we got them. I, I think I went to the police station, reported it to the police, and somehow the police tracked them down. I don't remember how. But we got it back. I went to the police station, I saw those boys. When I saw them, I wasn't angry with them, but I gave them some advice that they shouldn't do this and to steal things from monks. It's especially, I asked them, what is your religion? They said, we're Buddhist. <laughs> 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 to steal things from monks from a monastery, very dangerous. <laughs> do you realize what kind of karma you're creating? <laughs> Okay, so, but, but this is a very good point you make, that this is advice for training. It doesn't mean that we're already at that level, but we have to train ourselves step by step to reach that. Then the Buddha says, if you keep this advice on the simile of the sword constantly in mind, you see, that's the simile that the Buddha is giving for us to remind ourselves. Do you see any kind of speech trivial or gross, that you could not endure. And so the monks say, no, Venerable Sir. And so then the Buddha says, therefore you should keep this advice on the simile of the saw constantly in mind. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. There's another interesting point coming out of the simile. Can anybody get what it might be? Just look at paragraph 21, the sentence, if you keep this advice on the simile of the saw constantly in mind, do you see any course of speech, trivial or gross, that you could not endure? It's very like the mastery of the mind in the last sut sutta that we studied last week. Yeah. It's a different practice that seems to aim at the same yeah, yeah. But there's something else that I had specifically in mind that just occurred to me when I read that sentence. It, it would make anything you're enduring trivial compared to the, the being sought. <laughs> in fact, yeah, that just expresses in a different way the point that I had in mind. The simile deals with a case where somebody is actually sawing your body apart, mm -hmm. limb by limb. But it's applied, the Buddha isn't saying, therefore, monks, you should be able to keep your mind in the state of loving-kindness even when others saw you apart, mm -hmm. limb by limb. But he's taking it to a more tolerable situation, at least as a starting point for training. Therefore, you should be able to endure any course of speech. So, when you apply the simile of the mind, when you apply the simile of the soil in one's mind, then one thinks, when others are speaking to you in angry, harsh ways, you think, the Buddha said that when, if bandits were to saw us apart, or to saw me apart limb by limb, I should be able to endure it. So what to me are these harsh words? It's a little bit like, when we were children, we used to have this verse, sticks and stones might break my bones, but words can never harm me. Actually, words can do a lot of harm. <laughs> but um, one uses this as a kind of guideline for training or practice. Okay, so this takes us through the simile of the soul. Any questions that come out from this?
Is it from the internet? Okay, one question. Jesus also taught, talked, turn the other cheek in the Sermon of the Plains, the Sermon of the Mount. Instead of turning the other cheek, isn't it better to just run away? Also, isn't it better to run away from, <laughs> from the bandits with the two-handled sword? Yeah, first of all, I think Jesus' advice about turning the other cheek, I don't think that should be taken literally. It doesn't mean literally that if somebody hits you, you just function like a masochist and say, yeah, that felt good, <laughs> but don't do it on that cheek, do it on the other cheek. <laughs> so you have to uh, interpret that piece of advice according to the intention, not take it literally. The point, I think, is not to take revenge on the person who speak, who hits you on one cheek, but instead regard them with compassion and maybe even do a good turn to them as a way of sort of breaking down their hatred or hostility. And then the question, isn't it better to run away from the bandits? Of course, it's better to run away from them, but I think the simile is presupposing that <laughs> as you were running away, you slipped on a little track of muddy ground and the bandits have caught you and tied you up and they're cutting you to pieces and so you can't get away from them. Okay, the other question is just a matter of, of translation. I won't say the whole question, I'll just give the answer. Yes, the two phrases in the Majjhima and in the Sanghutra Sutta are the same in Pali, it's just being translated in different ways. Any other question? Uh, two questions, and appreciate your comments on either or both. Okay. Uh, several times, the phrase based on the household life, mm -hmm. and that, and here we are, a bunch of householders, and I, I wonder uh, if that is, I wonder about it, because it seems to imply that we as householders need not or do not attempt to follow the same training in our, in, in our own way. The other question is the one about colleagues. whose uh, intentions are uh, seen, uh, maybe seen as strange. I mean, she's, she's taunting. Yeah, I have to say I agree with you about that. <coughs> I don't like to s criticize a, a simile or a story given by the Buddha, but it seems it's a little extreme that the maid, it's deliberately violating her duties just to test the, her mistress, and properly she shouldn't behave in that way. I'll come back to the other question. Did you have some comment on that point? No, I was just going to say that it was well brought up, because every time I read the suit up, I get very angry, especially at that little parable. Because yeah. she's probably a pervert, a thing here. She's a pervert. I mean, to do that, to deliberately tweak somebody, yeah. that's some bad... Yeah, I have to agree with that, yeah. She deserved a cloud on the head. Just, just <laughs> I have to say, the cloud on the head is a little strong, but if it injures her physically, that goes to an extreme. But um, if she just answers, you know, what is it to you, madam? I've just decided to get up late today. I mean, she's not fulfilling her responsibility as an employee of the household. Yeah, but the simile is, is that uh, we should not assault someone, even though she's violating. Uh, take the, uh, see, even though she's violating her duty, we have no right to hit her. So therefore, it makes it worse or better. In other words, she could have just said, look, I'm sorry, I'm maybe, maybe sick, I understand, I need more time. Maybe you need a week of rest. Maybe you need to take off a little bit so that you could rest. Maybe 
if you, so therefore you can work with compassion, and therefore, you know, I mean, I've done this in many cases with employees where they, I used to do it where they come in and they couldn't make one day. I say, listen, take the day off next day. And say, no, no, I'm coming tomorrow. No, no, just take off. And I make them take off. That person would take off and it would work because I would give them a few days. And therefore, they would come back and say, but I'm going to lose money. Well, that's okay because they need rest. And they come back and next time they come in town. So therefore, I work with this person so that instead of hurting them, I hurt them in the pocket where it hurts. So she could have done the same thing with her. I said, listen, you could take off. And you don't get paid for your rest. And she will come back eventually and say, oh, she has good temper. She worked perfectly the way she worked around people. That's what he's trying to say. Yeah. But of course, either way you put it, of course she did something that was intentional because she was testing it. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, I think we don't have to insist on taking the simile to imply that the Buddha is approving of that way of testing. Right. Testing one's employer. It's just um, a simile to bring out the point that sometimes somebody can have an apparently weak, gentle, humble exterior, but inside they're still hovering. Okay, coming back to the first question. I have to say, within, say, the context of household life, again, like if one is training according to the Buddha's teaching, one should be training, you know, not to get angry, say, if somebody speaks badly about one's wife, one's husband, one's children. Ideally, one shouldn't get angry, but naturally one feels a certain degree of worldly affection for them. So, certainly one should come to their defense, <laughs> unless one agrees with the criticism. <laughs> But it seems to be just an expression that was used. The more we would, might translate it, Gehen Nisita, it's literally depending upon the house or depending upon the home, connected with the house, connected with the home. So it's referring more to the kind of ways of reacting that will go on in ordinary household life. It doesn't mean that somebody who's a householder but a follower of the Buddha's teaching shouldn't also be trying to train in this way. But at the same time, I would say one should recognize that because of the affection that arises from family relationships, sometimes the responses will be um, more difficult to modify and control than it would be to other people. Well, I have to say, not, it doesn't happen only in householder, amongst householders, but in the monastery, sometimes if one has, a, you have a teacher, a preceptor or a teacher, and then you're with some other monks, and they speak <laughs> critically about your teacher, then naturally you get upset and angry with them. Like I used to hear about the well, the American monk, Achan Sumedho, People would say that he never gets angry under any circumstances, except if others criticize Hachman Shah, his teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just were reading my mind because I was thinking of Ajahn Sumedho when he was, he was speaking when he was younger. You know, he was a young, relatively young monk, and he's like, well, he's just about the best teacher there is. You can go. And he would get really angry. He yeah. wouldn't say it. Okay. But he just wanted to kill them. He was like, <laughs> I, I do have, um, I think it's interesting, the other similes, the Buddha says you know, that the other person will read just weariness and disappointment. Yeah, yeah. In a certain way, he, this is a very effective defense yeah. that in, I find as a householder and in watching international affairs that as a wife and mother, if I don't get angry when I am provoked, um, if my child is very anxious, my husband gets very anxious, yeah. I will often, they will try to goad me into an argument. But if I do not get angry, I am like, sort of like a martial arts master. And the, either the argument will dissipate, or you know something will change, but I have to keep grounded 
keep yeah. you know stable and not let them make me lose my balance. And I noticed like when I watched um, the news, like when um, Biden, Vice President Biden was in Israel and was surprised with this terrible news, I could see how angry he was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what a struggle it was for him to maintain his yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 dignity. But uh, when, when I read this, we're letting the other person, the opponent, read weariness and disappointment. Yeah. It's also a very effective yeah. Yeah. way of defending yourself, yeah. don't you yeah. think? Yeah. In fact, I... well, <clears throat> last week I told you about the method that I used when I was taking walks in West Hempstead, Long Island, mm -hmm. when the cars go by. like. And somebody shouts something insulting out the window from, of the car as it goes by. Why don't you dress like a human being? Why don't you put on some slacks and a shirt? What are you, a freak or something? If I look up, then they win. But if I just keep on focusing on my feet, continue to look down, then they reap weariness and frustration <laughs> in a sense. Okay, I think we'll have to end now the discussion, the discussion now, but we'll continue after lunch. We'll come back for a little while. So if you have other points you want to discuss, then please return after lunch. Um, next week is the 20th. I won't have a class next week. The 27th, what I've decided to do, there'll be a retreat going on. I want to enter that retreat, but the morning of the 27th, I'll hold the class. Otherwise, it'll, because two weeks after that, I won't be able to have the class. Then it will be too long a gap. So the 27th, I'll have, hold the class, but because the Kuan Yin Hall will be used for the retreat, we'll have the class in the Wu Wu Library. The library, you know, just as you're coming into the monastery. So please remember to go to the library next week. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The tw March 27th. The 27th. And when the reminder goes out, it will also, I'll have Kate Kaiji mention that in the reminder. Okay, we end with the verses to share the merits. Yeah, I found one thing that makes me angry. <laughs> <laughs> Not even another person speaking. <laughs> Not even sawing my legs. <laughs> Okay, we stand.